So as we move more and more towards multimodal composition and classes that involve a lot of different kinds of technologies associated with writing and expression, um, it becomes important for us to think about accessibility practices as well. Not only because accessibility in the classroom has always been important, but because when we think about digital media and digital writing, right, we have to really learn to anticipate differently abled students. And this is an issue I regularly address with the, the JUMP, the Journal for Undergraduate Multimedia Projects, because we get a lot of projects that don't fit neatly into sort of regular accessibility practices. So it's important to really think about what we're doing uh, with accessibility practice when it comes to multimedia composition, particularly the intersections of rhetoric and media. And the biggest one, I think, is, as far as classrooms go, is to think about multi-formatting everything. So whenever you design an assignment for students, you not only give them a physical handout, perhaps in multiple font sizes, but you make it available online so they can adjust it um, and download it onto their different devices. But more importantly, you think about perhaps not just online and in print, but rather, what if you were to present this as a video? So I like to, in my own work, to create videos that in, in, introduce the assignments to students. Not only do they reflect the kind of introduction I provide in class, but it gives students um, a sort of a much more tangible sense to going back to the assignment um, and allows me to talk through uh, the assignment in a particular way that I don't always get to in the handout. But you can think about this kind of multi-formatting in any number of venues. You can do, you know, podcasts, you can do audio files, um, just to try and give students as much access to the content in as many different forms as we might, it was, a, as time would allow. Um, and so that's, that's an important one. Uh, the, the second one I think that's really important in the technology age is to really think about accommodating technologies in the classroom. You know, we used to have a kind of blanket statement that if students were on their laptops or computers, odds are they were just checking Facebook and not listening. Um, but at this point in time, the technology has become so integrated into different learning strategies and structures that it's important that we that we learn to sort of be aware of what students are doing with it and, and accommodate that in very particular ways. I mean, they use the internet to research. They use um, different kinds of note-taking systems. They, you know, I have students regularly who come up and take pictures of the whiteboard after class as a way of capturing notes. Uh, and so rather than fighting the system, you know, the object is to turn to them and sort of really embrace this as a different mode of learning. Um, regularly, I have students who take those pictures of the whiteboard, sort of email them to me, and I share them with the class. And so that's another way of sort of really thinking about this as an opportunity rather than um, a sort of a, a hindrance to, to the learning environments that we're, we're working in. Uh, and then the last one, I think, and this is probably the most important one, is to think about moving your accessibility statement up in the document. Not only that, but thinking about offering your own kind of accessibility statement. Uh, and by doing this, by personalizing this, uh, the accessibility statement and by putting it, let's say, on the first page, you move it away from the procedural policy stuff and really think about it as an ethical and rhetorical engagement of what you do as a teacher. And it helps sort of act as a more welcoming, I think, trigger for students who may have differently able bodies and differently able learning needs. Um, and so it's just one way of thinking about how we approach accessibility, but particularly it gets reflected, again, as I mentioned, because of the way multimedia is coming to bear on our composition practices. I mean, you know, if you're teaching a class on uh, sound writing and you have a student in class who's deaf, I mean, that requires a different way of thinking about how one represents this material and this engagement. And so it's something I think to consider in the larger rhetoric and media conversation as we move forward, both as a scholarly practice, but as a very much a pedagogical uh, moment of importance.